here. Thank you. Um, is my audio okay? Everyone can hear me? Okay, good. Yeah, one note on that. I'm actually not even, that conference was yesterday. It was a Syriac Studies conference at Yale, and now I'm at my parents' house in Detroit. Um, so if you see a tornado, that's my nephew Damien uh, storming into the room. Um, so I am, the title of my paper is Aristotelian Mathematical Abstraction, and I added a subtitle uh, since uh, this was organized, What Mathematics Can and Can't Do. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to abstract from questions like whether abstraction is the right term or not. There are going to be some things that I'm going to be just sort of unsophisticated about in order to kind of get to my point. So I'm not sure I have an opinion on the question that you just asked. And there's going to be some overlap with uh, Dr. Katz's presentation. Um, so, and which, which I thought was uh, wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm just going to start it. This paper will outline the relationship between mathematics and the other speculative sciences, especially metaphysics, focusing on the descriptions of Aristotle in metaphysics six and 11, and on the ontological implications of mathematical abstraction. In particular, it will delineate the distinction between mathematics and metaphysics and identify the kinds of questions proper to each. Uh, so the first section is the three speculative sciences and their formal objects. And I do wanna say this out front, uh, I am going to, again, sort of unsophisticatedly use some later scholastic terms and some organizational things that are found in, for example, Aquinas that might not be as clear in Aristotle. So excuse me for that as well. Um, Aristotle's view of science, though broader than that of that, of, for example, Descartes and his heirs, is still strictly defined as that which arrives at universal, unchanging, and necessary knowledge. Universal, because knowledge of some particular cat, however fluffy, might not teach us much about all cats and fail to give us possession of the science of catology. Unchanging, because what we seek in science is what is permanent about our object of study. And if you cannot step on the same cat twice, or if cats become different beings at every moment, there can be no permanent knowledge of them. Necessary, because what we seek in science is what must be the case for our object of study, such as the skin and purring and sassy attitude of the feline species, not its size or fur color, which are variant. The opposites of these three attributes of science, namely particularity, change, and contingency, are connected for Aristotle and for some of his inheritors to individual matter, which is the cause of an individual thing's particularity, its ability to change, and its contingency. And therefore, to introduce the lesser known term in this paper's title, scientific knowledge comes from abstracting from or leaving behind the aspects of a thing caused by its material and focusing on its form or species, what it has in common with other members of the same class. There's obviously much more to say about this, which I, among many others, have done elsewhere. What all sciences, according to Aristotle, have in common is that they seek universal, unchanging, and necessary truths. Sciences are differentiated, however, in two related ways. And now I'm here speaking of the speculative sciences in particular. First of all, the different sciences, quote, mark off some particular being, some genus, and inquire into this, but not into being simply, nor qua being. That is, each science has its own object of study different from the others. Second, each science's objects has its own, quote, first principles and elements and causes, more or less precise. The second differentiation follows from the first. Because the object of the science is different, the principles and causes arrived at are different, and depending on the object, more or less precise. This is best explained by example, and I will use Aristotle's three speculative sciences as my examples. Natural philosophy, mathematics, and what he calls first philosophy and theology, but I will call metaphysics, are Aristotle's three speculative sciences, each of which has its own formal object. I, I introduced here the qualifier formal for the object of these sciences to distinguish it from a material object, which might be closer to how we differentiate sciences today. When we define botany as a science of plant life and zoology as a science of animal life, we are referring to classes of material objects. 
Aristotle's formal division of the speculative sciences does not refer to classes of material objects, but rather a division of objects as objects of understanding. Indeed, botany and zoology, along with biology, chemistry, and many other sciences, would all probably be branches of what Aristotle calls natural philosophy. Similarly, geometry and astron astronomy fall under what Aristotle calls, quote, universal mathematics. Natural philosophy, mathematics, and metaphysics are distinguished by their objects under two aspects, immobility and separation. Why immobility? Because science is universal, unchanging, and necessary, and therefore it must be abstracted from matter, the principle of individuality, as opposed to universality, change, as opposed to unchangingness, and contingency, as opposed to necessity. More precisely, the second quality of scientific knowledge, that it is unchanging, is simply to say that its objects are immobile. Immobility of object, especially since it is related to universality and necessity, is what makes a science a science rather than a passing knowledge of some individual thing. This being the case, for Aristotle, the consequence is that those sciences which are more immobile with, sorry, those sciences with more immobile objects are more perfect and accurate sciences. Mathematics, because its objects are more immobile than those of natural philosophy, which I will discuss below, is in that way more of a science. What Aristotle means by the second distinguishing aspect of speculative sciences, separation, is that its objects can exist separately. That is, they are not simply objects of the mind, but true substances independently existing of reality. The objects of natural philosophy are sensible substances in the world, and more precisely, substances that have in themselves a principle of motion and rest, which exist outside the mind. One object of metaphysics, at least, considered as theology or divine science, is God or the gods, who presumably also exist outside the mind. Here, mathematics, according to especially Aquinas, I think is really kind of uh, strong on this point, um, uh, mathematics is the exception, since its objects, numbers and figures considered as such, only exist as such while embodied imperfectly in some material medium and in their pristine purity exist only in the mind, not separately in some Platonic world forms. Aristotle argues extensively against Platonic forms in Metaphysics 1.9, and particularly against mathematics as, against mathematicals as Platonic forms in Metaphysics 13 and 14. While immobility is the thing that makes all the speculative sciences to be sciences, the combination of immobility and separation is what makes them different sciences. Natural philosophy's objects are mobile and separate. The objects of mathematics are immobile, but not separate. The objects of metaphysics are immobile and separate. A final point in this section described in Aristotle's work and developed in its terminology in later centuries is the various types of matter in the objects of the different speculative sciences. Matter, as noted above, is Aristotle's principle of individuality, change, and contingency, and therefore unintelligibility. A thing is less knowable the more it is bound up in matter, and therefore any scientific knowledge of it must be abstract, that is, abstracted from its material conditions. However, the objects of natural philosophy and of mathematics, unlike presumably those of metaphysics, exist in matter and in the case of natural philosophy, cannot be fully understood with it without some reference to their material. There must, therefore, be some aspect of matter still present in understanding these objects, even after they have been abstracted from their individual changing and contingent reality, what Aristotle terms individual matter, and later is called signate matter, that is, some individual portion of matter which can be pointed at. The term for matter still present not in a particular cat who has this particular flesh, bones, and fur, but in natural philosophy's understanding of cats or catness, which is, quote, cats have flesh, bones, and fur, and sort of a definition of, of, of what a cat is, 
that sense of matter is termed common matter as opposed to individual matter. In mathematics, it makes no difference what our triangles and circles are made of insofar as we're doing mathematics. And this most refined version of matter, which abstracts from everything except extension and number, is called intelligible matter. It uses that term in metaphysics 710. Metaphysics, the most abstract science, retains no materiality at all. Section two, uh, mathematical abstraction. As quoted above, quote, each science has its own principles, elements, and causes, which are arrived at by different kinds of abstraction. Natural philosophy abstracts the universal species from the particular, retaining common matter, but abstracting from designate matter. That is, natural philosophy ignores the individual differences of members and of, of members of a natural species of a thing and pays attention to what is common between them. Mathematics abstracts from material composition and retains only number and extension. These are the principles by which it operates. Its objects are immovable. Triangles and threes do not grow or die like orangutans and trees do. Within mathematics as a science, its objects are also posited putatively as beings in their own right. The, mathemat the mathematician stipulates, quote, you know, let a line be breadth as length or let there be a perfect circle. And he, makes he or she makes deductions based on these axioms or definitions, which are its own principles. It's worth noting in passing that ma mathematical principles for Aristotle do not seem to be a priori in the strong sense of known completely independently of the senses, but rather are learned through abstraction from the senses. We learn about the abstract number three by counting three apples, and we learn about abstract triangles by playing with wooden triangle blocks. Mathematical principles are a priori in a different sense, however, which we have some people have come to call kind of analytical, in that deductions can be made from them without the external verification required in natural sciences. Aristotle does not believe that in the innate ideas implanted in the mind by the god of Descartes, but neither is he so extremely empiricist that he requires experiment to verify that three and one made four. Indeed, this balanced understanding of the origins of mathematics in the sensible world might go a long way toward solving the applicability problem described in Eugene Wigner's The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. While mathematical principles are rooted in the sensible world, they operate without reference to either particular or common matter. Thus, quote, the mathematician investigates abstractions. And that might not be the best translation, but it's there. And quote, strips off all the sensible qualities when she does her work. This allows mathematics to be very clear and certain relative to the human mind. Aristotle gives further reasons why this is the case. Uh, this is a long, longer quote from Posterior Analytics 112. In mathematics, the formal fallacy is not so common because it is the middle term in which the ambiguity lies since the major is predicated of the whole of the middle and the middle of the whole of the minor. And in mathematics, one can, so to speak, see these middle terms with an intellectual vision, while in didactic, the ambiguity may ex escape detection. We can see, according to Aristotle, the middle term which connects the other terms and is the quote, because of the conclusion with intellectual vision. In other words, when making a mathematical demonstration, the reason why a conclusion follows is glaringly clear to our minds. This is unsurprising since there are fewer irrelevant details, such as sensible qualities, to distract us. Similarly, Aristotle says that, quote, mathematical sciences concern forms, and another quote, and definitions, but never an accident. This distilled focus on definitions allows mathematical demonstrations to always be in the first syllogistic figure, which is the only one capable of making a universal affirmative conclusion. That's again, posterior analytics uh, 114. The objects of mathematics are also more immobile, since again, by abstracting number and figure alone, we ignore the principles of change, which Aristotle names actuality and potential. A number or a figure considered in itself always remains as it is and never becomes something else. 
This permanence is harmonious with and attractive to the intellect, and especially to science, which by its nature seeks permanent or unchanging understanding. Seen from a different perspective, the individual matter of particular beings, which contains actuality and potential, and therefore change. The common matter in the definition of a natural species contains the principles of change only in the abstract, and the intelligible matter of mathematics does not have them at all. A round fingernail can break, and the species fingernail can be described as breakable, but a geometrical semicircle on a Euclidean plane is eternally unbreakable. If Aristotle's account of the abstraction of mathematical principles is correct, and if he's also right about the causal relationship between change and time, then it might not be a surprise that the arrow of time is hard to find in a purely mathematical description of nature. On the other hand, mathematics, quote, investigates abstractions and, quote, strips off all the sensible qualities, which allows it to produce knowledge that is both permanent and clear and therefore certain to the mind. On the other hand, the conclusions it is capable of validly making must be based on premises of exactly this kind. More cannot be said in a conclusion than is said in the premises. Mathematics can make a conclusion about semicircles, and this conclusion can explain why my fingernail cannot go inside a ring with a smaller radius. But it cannot explain why, why my fingernail is broken, because this requires a knowledge of principles and qualities that mathematical abstraction deliberately ignores in its first steps. The reason for the clarity of mathematics is also the reason for its limitations. Parallel to this limitation is the fact noted earlier that mathematics, while it is making its demonstrations, grammatically posits its abstract objects as if they are true, separate beings in the world. This is a quote from Math uh, Metaphysics uh, six one. Mathematics also, however, is theoretical, but whether its objects are immovable and separable from matter is not, is not, is not at present clear. Still, it is clear that some mathematical theorems consider them qua immovable and qua separable from matter. It would be strange if mathematical demonstrations always required an ontological clarification in every proposition. The ends of a line are points, but remember, we're talking about in abstractions and there are no real lines or points except in our minds. It'd be strange if you always had to say that when viewed in mathematics. At the very least, it would make the demonstrations cumbersome, if not nearly impossible to follow. At worst, it requires mathematics to make statements for which it has no authority to speak. Whether or not there are separately existing lines and points is not a mathematical question, but a metaphysical one. For this reason, Euclid and others simply state their definitions and wisely move on without bothering with ontology. The nature of mathematics as a science, in sum, requires it to ignore sensible qualities, but this is completely different from a positive denial that sensible qualities exist in reality. Mathematics knows that three unicorns plus two unicorns equals five unicorns and that the center of an adamantium circle is equidistant from its circumference. It does not know and cannot know whether unicorns or adamantium exist. Similarly, its language requires it to posit abstract objects as if they were real and separable, to use the earlier term, but this is completely different from a positive affirmation that there are independently, independently existing number forms in some Platonic world. Part three, mathematical abstraction and metaphysical questions. I will conclude this paper by discussing metaphysics more closely as it relates to mathematics. Aristotle makes two claims relevant to this relationship. The first gives us an insight into the nature of metaphysics and was partially cited above. This is a quote. We are seeking the principles and causes of the things that are, and obviously of them qua being. For, for while there is a cause of health and of good condition, and the objects of mathematics have first principles and elements and causes, and in general every science, which is ratiocinative or it all involves reasoning, deals with causes and principles, more or less precise, all these sciences mark off some particular being, some genus, and inquire into this, but not into being simply, nor qua being, nor do they offer any discussion of the essence of the things of which they treat. But starting from the essence, 
some making it plain to the senses, others assuming it as a hypothesis, they then demonstrate more or less cogently the essential attributes of the genus with which we, they deal. It is obvious, therefore, that such an induction yields no demonstration of substance or of the essence, but some other way of exhibiting it. And similarly, the sciences omit the question whether the genus with which they deal exists or does not exist, because it belongs to the same kind of thinking to show what it is and that it is. Sorry for the very long quote. Familiarly, metaphysics is the science of being qua being, and this definition should be clearer now in contrast with the other speculative sciences. Natural philosophy is the science of being qua moving or changing. It brackets off the quote genus of moving things and attempts to understand how and why they move, the principles and causes of their motion. Mathematics is the science of being qua extended in geometry or countable in arithmetic. And again, it brackets off the genus of extended or countable things and attempts to understand them as such. It is important to note that Aristotle is not dividing the world of beings numerically into things that move and things that are extended and countable as if they would be two collections of different substances. Both of them are sciences of being. They just approach being according to two different aspects, motion on the one hand and extension or number. We can look at a field of olive trees and attempt to understand their common nature or species. And we can look at the very same field of olive trees and count them or measure them and calculate their average height. The beings or materially op material objects would be the same. Our focus or formal object would be different. Metaphysics is at the same time the most general and the most focused of the speculative sciences. It removes all quas and attempts to examine being as such without any specification about motion or quantity or anything else. The result is that the things that it can say are the most abstract, unchanging, and necessary, since they are the furthest removed from matter, and if it suits you, even apply to God or the gods. They're also the most universal, because they apply to everything insofar as it exists, not only insofar as it moves or is extended or countable. Its principles can almost sound trivial, like a thing is itself, and a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same respect. But those principles apply in natural philosophy as well as mathematics, like federal laws apply in subjugated states. Most importantly for my purposes here, because metaphysics attempts and is the only science which attempts to speak about being as such, it is the only one capable by definition of determining whether and how something exists. The inductions of natural philosophy and mathematics, I'm using induction kind of broadly here, yield, quote, no demonstration of substance or of the essence, because, quote, it belongs to the same kind of thing, same kind of thinking, to show what it is and that it is. In other words, what it means that something exists, the weather exists, are questions that are proper, even exclusive, to metaphysics. Why can metaphysics do this? Because it does not section off some genus of being, but asks about being as such. And again, I apologize for a kind of longer quote here. Since even the mathematician uses the common axioms only in a special application, it must be the business of first philosophy to examine the principles of mathematics also. That when equals are taken from equals, the remainders are equal, is common to all quantities, but mathematics studies a part of it of its proper matter, which it has detached, for example, lines, angles, or numbers, or some other kind of quantity, not however qua being, but insofar as each of them is continuous in one or two or three dimensions. But philosophy does not inquire about particular subjects insofar as each of them has some attribute or another or other, but speculates about being insofar as each particular thing is. Physics, or what I'm calling natural philosophy, is in the same position as mathematics. For physics studies, the attributes and the principles of the things that are qua moving and not qua being, whereas the primary science, we have said, deals with these only insofar as the underlying subjects are existent and not in virtue of any other character. And so both physics and mathematics must be classed as parts of wisdom. All that's from Metaphysics 11.4. Whether and how mathematical entities such as numbers and figures exist 
is therefore not a question for mathematics to answer, but rather for first philosophy or metaphysics. Mathematics takes its principles for granted, or rather simply does not ask the question in the first place. This division of labor is a good thing for mathematics because it allows it to do its job without burdening it with questions it is unable to answer. It is one question how the sides of a triangle relate to one another in measurement, and another one entirely whether there are ideal triangles out there somewhere. And each of these questions is answered by means of, a, of different principles of different sciences. Mathematical abstraction ignores whether a thing exists or not its essence, and everything about it besides extension and number. It would be folly to expect it later to answer questions related to any of these things, like removing someone's eardrums and then asking them to rate, rate the quality of a symphony. If we begin by requiring mathematics only to attend to shape and quantity, and then later ask it about qualities or essence or existence, we are doing something unjust. On the one hand, mathematicians putatively posit their objects as if separate without asserting their ontologically separate existence. On the other hand, they focus only on these mathematical abs uh, uh, aspects in isolation without denying the existence of other aspects of reality, such as motion, quality, or substance. This is an example of the interrelation of sciences. Each focuses on its own questions and should be conscious not to assume answers that can only be answered by another science. This gives each science the freedom to do what it is meant to do without worrying about questions external to the science itself. Thank you. All right, thank you, Father Andy, um, for that talk. It was perfect timing. It gives us 15 minutes for um, Q&A. So um, I'm gonna start with Emily. Thanks. This was really interesting. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll I'll just right. I'll just ask one. Um, so, given this uh, division of labor, which I find very um, persuasive uh, and important, um, how can you just say a little bit about how um, sciences uh, that use mathematics but are about the natural world fit into the picture? Um, like optics yeah. and harmonics and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 So there's two ways to answer that question. And I heard two slightly distinct questions as you were asking it. One is very much in the in the forefront of my mind a lot, which is what about modern physics, which is very, very mathematical, kind of Newtonian, at least sort of foundational. And the other one is, I mean, even within Aristotle's works, there are mathematical sciences like astronomy. Um I guess I would say two things. One is using a math using a mathematical principle in a natural sciences is very much allowed, assuming the Aristotelian principles that I posited, be, exactly because they are more abstract, and uh, it's and similarly a metaphysical principle like the principle of identity would apply to mathematics and that would also apply to everything in natural philosophy, and so there's a sort of rule of thumb and this is uh, aquinas has a kind of big chunk where he kind of discusses this very explicitly there's a rule of thumb where the more abstract sciences and their principles do apply to the less abstract ones uh whereas vi the vice you know vice versa it just wouldn't work uh, it just doesn't matter you know whether a triangle is you know made of bronze or of wood th the principles of triangles are going to apply to it but the principles of wood are not going to apply to an abstract triangle when we're when we're doing euclidean geometry um I don't know if that addresses your question at all I kind of yeah it, does. I was, it okay. does I was I just I really liked your thing about you know removing someone's eardrums and asking them to <laughs> read a symphony yeah. I was just thinking uh you know if we've stripped away all this stuff uh you know in physics 2-2 two, two, uh you know optics considers uh something mathematical but then applies it to the natural world I was just wondering how you saw that working yeah that, that's the, that's the way I think it would work and so it would so it wouldn't be like stripping somebody's eardrums. It would be like, you know, giving somebody those, you know, those sunglasses that are just red. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that they're used for like optical illusion books and stuff like that. It would be, okay, you're giving them those, but you're asking them just to sort of say, well, how many candles are on the table? You're not asking them to say something about their color. So there's still something that mathematics can say about uh, the objects of natural philosophy, just not everything. 
Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right, Eduardo. Sorry about that. Uh, just a very brief comment. Uh, thank you, Father Andrew. It was fantastic. And I think you already answered a question that was asked in, in a couple of previous presentations. I just wanted to point out that. And it uh, links up with what Emily was just was, was just, just asking. Um, in, um, in the posterior analytics, uh, Aristotle gives like uh, he compares one science to another according to certitude, acribologia, and St. Thomas comments on, on this. And uh, one of the ways in which he compares, you know, which one is prior and more certain um, is, of course, whether uh, science knows the, the, the prosti, the, the, on account of what, and the, or the hoti, that it is the case that it is so. So that would be this relationship also between the, uh, 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 the uh, let's say, mathematics and those uh, sciences that are under uh, mathematics or that apply to some matter. And the other, and the other one is um, uh, it, it goes back to what Emily was saying about using uh, subtraction rather than uh, than abstraction. Um, and uh, Aristotle says that uh, some sciences are had uh, by addition or from addition, prosteseos. Um, so so that. Uh, uh, and the example that he gives is geometry compared to arithmetic. So uh, the uh, principle of number is one unit. Um, and to this one, um, uh, uh, geometry adds position so that it's some unit, some, something one that has a, a position. And because of this, um, geometry is posterior to arithmetic um, and, less, uh, uh, and less, uh, has less certitude um than 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 arithmetic and uh, again this uh uh this uh, uh shows how these two are contraries the addition of principles and then the subtraction if you're going uh towards uh abstract what we call abstraction uh, that was right. everything i wanted to comment thank you yeah no i think those are both really good points um this is not quite really as what you said but i, I do want to say this regarding something that came up at the, the end of the last uh, paper, which I'm really glad I was able to catch, um, that yes, the, the sort of thing we're talking about when we're doing any of these sciences, according to Aristotle, is some being in the world. But there's a there's a whole story to be told about once we've abstracted these principles or causes, we can do things with them. And this is kind of how like astronomy or harmonics can apply. Okay. I've learned what a triangle is. I've learned how, how a circle works. Well, now that I've learned it, I sort of have it. You know, not as if it's this independent thing, but now that I have it, I can sort of shape it and, and kind of apply it to all kinds of different things. And I think uh, Newtonian physics is, is a really a kind of amazing example of that, where we have these mathematical principles now, and we can explain tons and tons and tons of things in the world using these things that are, that are totally abstract. And the way that we can do that, there's a sort of spot in the, imagination again Aquinas Aquinas kind of has more kind of material on this but there's a sort of spot in in the imagination where we can it's like a empty document where we can draw things using these principles that we've learned and sometimes they can kind of have a nice application to less abstract things that are in the world thank you father yeah. all right Emily well we've got uh some more time and I heard you've got some more questions so are you uh, you game for asking any of them? Uh, sure. Yeah. So my my other question was just uh, actually just inviting you to say a little bit more about intelligible matter um, because uh, it's something I'm been thinking about writing about, um, and I was just wondering. Uh, so you said something along the lines of it having to do with number and extension. Um, I was wondering if you think that numbers. Uh, as well as magnitudes have intelligible matter. Um, and I'll say Inter that interesting question. Yeah. I'll say that I think so. Um, yeah. but I but I wonder if if you think so, and maybe I just wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about your view. So the, the, my favorite place to read about this is in Aquinas's uh, division of the what is it called? Division and Methods of the Sciences. It's a selection of a longer work translated, but um, uh, 
I think so. I think, I think the intel so intelligible matter is distinct from the common matter of a species and then just the individual matter of a, of a thing. So it's the most abstract form, uh, type of matter. And it is in geometry, I think intelligible matter is simply extension period. Um, and I think Descartes, I think about Descartes a lot, but I think Descartes just made that matter in general. He sort of said that's all matter is, all matter is, is simply extension. Whether number countable thing has a matter, I think the intelligible matter of, of number is the one that you're counting. So for example, that this, you know, thinker Jacob Klein, who has a, this kind of story about the, the ancient Greek world, it was never four plus four is eight. It was four ones plus four ones is eight ones. I think those ones are the intelligible matter of, of countable things. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so you have a broader view of intelligible matter. You don't identify it just with extension, but only in the case no. of magnetic. I, I agree with you on that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right, we have about five minutes still if anyone else um, wants in. I'll say this for, you know, oh, sorry, Eduardo. No, I just wanted to to agree with you both. <laughs> I, I want to say, yeah, the, I mean, what what are numbers made of according to Aristotle, if not if not units? So that's the uh, it's a, not the matter, not only the matter from which because you put together multiple units, but also the matter in which numbers exist, and that's that goes back to what Emily explained before. Um, that it's something that things have, <laughs> and also the things themselves, because it's the multitude. <clears throat> so I, 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 I would agree. I mean, uh, numbers and magnitudes have to be made of something. It's intelligible and it's imaginable as well, as St. Thomas point points out. By the way, St. Thomas says uh, concerning intelligible matter, sometimes he identifies it with, with just the imaginable and sometimes he identifies it with substance because, of course, substance is the first subject in which quantity is found. That, that's all I wanted to point out. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, Tim? That's a quick question. Where, in your opinion, would set theory fit in uh, the kind of general picture you I, I will try to be wise and uh, say that I don't know enough about it to have an opinion. Um, I would, you know, if somebody, if I had that question, I would ask, oh, he's not here, uh, uh, Dr. Franklin. But yeah, so no, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about it to answer your question. Maybe somebody else here would be able to. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, Dr. Franklin's opinion, actually. <laughs> Me, my opinion is that that it, uh, a set theory really refers to predication, to the order of predication. So we are in Sorry. logic, not not really in mathematics. Though we call it mathematics analogically, but but it's not mathematics in the sense that Aristotle or the ancient Greeks would would um, um, uh, identify it as mathematics. A anyway. They uh, they didn't uh, even Aristotle said that the that uh, um, every science has a subject genus and um, a science is one whose whose subject genus is one and those sciences are diverse uh, uh, or multiple whose uh, principles are diverse so in the even in the case of geometry and arithmetic which were the two purely mathematical sciences, these were not the same science because they don't, do not have the same principles, right? So, Again, so, geometry, sorry. the sorry, point. Eduardo. Sorry, just there's two more in the queue. Can, oh, I'm sorry. Can yeah, no, I no, thought no, there was right. nothing else. Well, no, 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 there I'll leave it there. You know it's a, they, no, it's okay. Up, I don't so. need to say more. I, on no, the contrary, sorry. I'd like to hear more. Daniel, did you have a question or did you? Okay, um, Stefan, I guess then. Stefan, are you with us? Ah, there you are. Nope, we can't hear you. Okay, so it, it was just a general remark about uh, intelligible matter. Uh, I think it, it the, the 
main aspect uh, of the main feature of, it, of uh, intelligible matter in, in Aquinas is the the feature of cognitive dependence because intelligible matter is is that on which something depends to be uh, understood and that's why I see intelligible matter print, uh, mainly as uh, an epistemic feature rather than metaphysical metaphysical one I I, I think in, in my way of reading Aquinas is to to to, to understand intelligible matter as ha having a uh, mainly a, 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 an epistemic function rather than metaphysical one. So I don't know if, if you agree with that. I don't know. I mean, it's certainly when, when we're doing an abstract science, yeah, it's not, and we've, we've, we're trying to isolate why a thing, you know, why a triangle has a cer certain properties. We're certainly not saying there that intelligible matter has some ontology out there in the world that's that's kind of doing a kind of platonic uh move there um but we're still describing something that's in reality uh in some way uh so i'm not sure about the sort of epistemology metaphysic where the kind of line would be in that that's an interesting consideration all right so i think that's our time but thank you so much to father andy a pleasure thank you for having me